Okay, so uh, here goes our United Methodist trivia for today. First question. This person was thrown into the den of lions because he got caught praying to God. Daniel. Anybody, anybody have a different answer than Daniel? Yeah, yeah there's Daniel. That's, sorry. That's the first. Second question. Jesus and his disciples practiced what religion? Jew. Jew. Uh -huh, I heard Jew, Judaism. Jew. Right. Jew. No, they were Baptist. <laughs> My mother-in-law thought they were, but no, they weren't. Okay. This Christian sacrament can be done by sprinkling, pouring, or dunking. Baptism. Baptism. Um, front row got it over here. Baptism is right. So y'all are doing so well. Chester did good at the beginning, too. Okay. Two girls were selling candy bars. Each started with 40 bars. And in a single day, each sold all 40 for a dollar each. But at the end of the day, they only had a dollar between the two of them. Why? My math person over here is... Huh? They were hungry. No. They bought some 40. They were... That's they bought something else. Actually, you're almost right, Dobby, because what they did is they bought them from each other. That's what I was oh. saying. So the only dollar they had was the first one. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, they were just a trade back one. Okay. Now we're back to the Bible. Jacob's son Joseph moved his family to this country in North Africa. Egypt. He, look at this guy. What's happening now? You guys are good. Oh, I'll fool you in a minute, maybe. Which of the following people was not one of Jesus' twelve disciples? Philip, Andrew, Joseph, or Simon? Philip. Philip. I heard Philip. Who else did I hear? Joseph. Joseph. I heard Joseph. Who says Joseph? Okay, I got two hands for who says Philip? Oh. It's Joseph. <laughs> when during worship, when during worship would the pastor say a benediction? Uh, Kathy got that one. <coughs> I have my hearing aids on. I'll turn them off in a minute. Yeah. The damn, that's called a benediction. All right. How many Sundays are there during the season, during the season of Advent? Twelve. Twenty. Twelve. Five. 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 Not twelve. Four. Well, let me give you a clue. Last week was the first Sunday of Advent, and Christmas is how many days away? <laughs> Leslie's back there giving you the high sign. Four. 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 This year, Christmas Eve is on Saturday. Uh -huh. What's in between Advent and Pentecost? Uh, Epiphany. Christmas. Uh -huh. So that whole time is Christmas. Yeah, Advent is up to Christmas. Christmas Eve is when Christmas starts. And it goes all the way to Epiphany. Christmas time. Which is January 6th. Which is 12 days. There's a song about it. About 12 days of Christmas. Okay. All right, we've got four. What's the four for? Four days. Four days. Oh, yeah, that's right. What member of the Holy Trinity is often represented by a dove or a flame? Spirit. Spirit. Oh. The Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yeah, I heard it. Somebody got it. <laughs> Let it go. Easter. Easter. My target is bad. Always falls in one. You know, and I look at them and I don't see it. Uh, Easter always falls in one of these two months. What two months are they? March, March, March or April. March or April. It is the, what is it? the first Sunday after the first Sunday after March 23rd. That's right. And the earliest it can be is March the 23rd. Right. And we've had it that early, pretty recently, a couple of years ago. March and April. And is that all? No. Ah, here we go. Okay, so you're running a race. Right before the finish line, you pass the person who's in third place. In what place do you finish? Third. 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 <laughs> third. Oh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we see, we, we really believe that it takes mental power to understand the Bible. So we have some mental questions as well as scriptural ones. Okay, next question. David's son, Absalom, murdered his half-brother who raped his sister, Tamar. What was Absalom's half-brother's name? 
Yeah, you know, we're doing so well. I don't have any No guesses. Start with an A. The answer is Amnon. Oh. Oh well. You know, you have to give me one you don't know. Okay. Galatia, Ephesus, and Colossae, cities to whom Paul wrote letters, are located in what current day country? Iran? No. Turkey. Israel. Who said that? Israel. JT, Turkey. Turkey. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we, well, JT's a preacher. He's supposed to. Be. <laughs> Members of the Religious Society of Friends Church are better known by what name? Quaker. Quaker, that's right. And in our community, where's the biggest Quaker community? Anybody know? Friendswood. People that go to Quaker churches are called friends. Guess what friends would have seen then? Coptic Christians live mostly in what country? <laughs> Who said that? Did, he, uh, did you say that? Yeah. Leslie said it. She just was right. What Wesleyan scholar came up with the term the Wesleyan quadrilateral? <laughs> Everybody's looking at JT. Uh, what Asbury was it? No. Oh, but he was there. Not Coach. No. <laughs> I just didn't know if it was not. You'll get there eventually. I don't know. I know it wasn't John Wesley, though. No, 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 no. It was a, it was a professor at Perkins School of Theology. His name is oh. Albert Cotter. <laughs> and he wished he would have never said it in the way of a tra of, a, of a, the whole deal of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And it, depending on the circumstance, one is primary over the other. But he wished he wouldn't have put it in the, everybody wants to make the square into a trapezoid anyway. It's just, it takes all four of those to study the Bible and to be closer to us. I think that's the last one. All right, we're going to watch the video and then we're going to worship. Tonight we're singing um, some hymns. They're, they're going to think, we're going to, the first one is Amazing Grace Chains, the one we do here all the time on Saturday night. Leslie's going to be playing on the piano. And, uh, and then uh, after that, we're going to sing another little short one. We're going to, it's kind of a prayerful thing. And then we're going to pray and light the Advent candle. And, uh, and so the movie's ready. Go. In our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. In our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. In our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. However, at our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts, and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real, it is living, it is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. We believe that God gives His love through the all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but He is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that He really died on the cross, and that He really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Welcome to our church. I forgot to mention to you, if you're interested in memorializing or honoring somebody with a poinsettia, the, the, poinsettia, the uh, envelopes are in the back. Uh, as you're able and willing, would you stand as we sing these, this is the great hymn of the church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
put that in there for a reason today. Uh, it's a sad day. Uh, many of us met today at our annual conference and 296 churches voted to leave our denomination. And actually, we voted for them to leave. They wanted to go. Uh, the church I grew up in is changing. And some people didn't want it to change. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's a pastor, and he said it this way. He said, when it comes time to meet Jesus Christ, would I rather, would I be willing to have him say what he had to say about me living with only righteous people or going to righteous places or doing righteous things? Or would I rather him say to me, thank you for living the life I live? of hanging out with people that are on the bubble, that don't necessarily know where they are. we That's the choice kind of that some of these people made, was to go with the righteous group. They perceived themselves to be righteous. And I was kidding the group at the table earlier. I said, I choose to hang out with sinners. And we're all sinners. And that's the place that I think God is going to do the most work. And that's the, when I get to meet him face to face, that's what I want him to say to me that he knew I did. So I'm grateful that this church never went through a period of discernment. We're staying with the United Methodist Church. Uh, another person, you may have seen it on Facebook, said it, I thought, pretty well. Would I rather be, let's see, I'm going to have to read it. I don't want to get it wrong. Sometimes I, I just quote things out of the air, but this one I'm not going to do. Hang on just a minute. I'd rather be excluded for those that I include than included for those that I exclude. Amen. I think that's pretty powerful. And, uh, and I think that sometimes out of the, you know, that those words came from a sinner. Uh, obviously. And, uh, and so I think, uh, you know, I'm not naming names to point it out. So um, as we prepare to light the Advent candle, and then we're going to pray. But in fact, let's just pray first tonight. I, uh, we have in our community, uh, we had some churches leave. The church at Channel View, all the churches in Baytown, the church in Mont Bellevue, the church in Dayton. All have left. Uh, in the northwest part of Houston, around Tomball, all the churches up there have left. Already new appointments have been appointed to new church, new preachers in there. Uh, my friend Jerry Neff was the pastor down at uh, Moody Memorial United Methodist in Galveston for a long time. Jerry just had double lung transplant surgery about two years ago, maybe three. He played his first round of golf with us in the Lakeview Golf Tournament the other day, and he's doing good. Uh, every Sunday, he's driving up to Jasper. The church at Woodville and the church at Jasper both disaffiliated. And he's meeting with 150 people, is what he told me, that were left out by their church and they want to be a part of the United Methodist Church. Uh, so Jerry is making that journey. They've already appointed a pastor for the, the Mont Bellevue, Baytown area, and they've already appointed one for the Cypress, whatever that is over there on the west side of town. Uh, there will be many more. It gives us great opportunity to create new church starts. And, uh, and all of you probably know somebody that was at a church that's gone now. You may not realize it, but you do. Um, the churches around here that left is Gateway, uh, what used to be called First Pasadena left. Uh, there are a lot of people in our community that were going to those churches. And uh, they're invited to come here. Uh, they are invited to come and be welcomed here. And we have a lot of room to do new and different stuff. So if there's people out there that have kids and want a big, bigger children's program than what we have right now, then let's, let's have one. Uh, we're, we're, we're open to all of that. So uh, it's, a, it's a time of change. Sometimes change is hard. And uh, it was, uh, there's many of the people I went to seminary with, many people that are friends of mine, hardly speak now because of the angst that's been created over this whole thing. And it makes me very sad. So let's pray. Gracious God, we, we know who we are. And we aren't perfect. We make mistakes. Sometimes we interpret the Bible wrong. Sometimes we don't interpret it at all. But we trust you. And we know that you handed the keys of the church off to Peter. 
And then you told all of us that you, we would do greater things than you've done. And we believe that with God's power, with the Holy Spirit's strength, with the teachings of Jesus, and the leadings that Jesus gives us to reach out into the communities around us, that these are going to be bright days ahead, not sad days. So we look forward to the time to come. We, we lift up prayers tonight for those people that are healing from surgeries and getting over things. We lift up for preachers that may not know where they're going to be next month after at January 1st. We lift up for congregations that may know, not know who their preacher will be. And we thank you for the continuity and the strength of the United Methodist Connection that has brought us to this place at this time. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So I, I should have already done it, and I didn't because I'm bad. I'm a sinner too. Uh, we should have one candle already lit, but we don't. But I'll do it right now. When we light the second candle, we're going to sing one verse. It'll be on the screen there. Uh, after after I say what I'm going to say, did you put it up there? And we'll. Uh, We'll sing one verse of okay. So come thou wisdom from on high, from the, the part of O come, O come, Emmanuel. So this is the second candle. We light this candle as a symbol of Christ the way. May the word sent from God through the prophets lead us to the way of salvation. O come, O come, Emmanuel. O come thou wisdom from on high. We never sing this on Saturday night, but you know what? I picked the songs because Chris is at a wedding, and Leslie just says, I'll play what you pick, and so we're good to go. Uh, it's, uh, let me find the, the book here, it's 451. If you're able, would you stand as we sing this together? Anybody, anybody have a different answer than Daniel? I thought it was David. Yeah, just yeah, Daniel. That's, <laughs> sorry. That's the first. Second question. Jesus and his disciples practiced what religion? Jew. Jew. Uh -huh, I heard Jew, Judaism. Jew. Right. It's bad for them. No, they weren't bad. <laughs> My mother-in-law thought they were, but no, they weren't. Okay. This Christian sacrament can be done by sprinkling, pouring, or dunking. Baptism. Baptism. Um, front row got it over here. Baptism is right. So y'all are doing so well. Chester did do it at the beginning, too. Okay. Two girls were selling candy bars. Each started with 40 bars. And in a single day, each sold all 40 for a dollar each. But at the end of the day, they only had a dollar between the two of them. Why? My math person over here is... Huh? They, they were hungry. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> they, they, they bought something. They, they bought something else. Actually, you're almost right, Dobby, because what they did is they bought them from each other. 
That's what I was going to say. So the only dollar they had was the first one. Otherwise, they were just a trade back one. Okay. Now we're back to the Bible. Jacob's son Joseph moved his family to this country in North Africa. Egypt. He, look at this guy. What's happening? Now you guys are good. Oh, I'll fool you in a minute, maybe. Which of the following people was not one of Jesus' twelve disciples? Philip, Andrew, Joseph, or Simon? Philip. Philip. I heard Philip. Who else did I hear? Joseph. Joseph. I heard Joseph. Who says Joseph? Okay, I got two hands for who says Philip? Oh. It's Joseph. <laughs> uh, when during worship, when during worship would the pastor say a benediction? Uh, Kathy got that one. I, heard <coughs> I have my hearing aids on. I'll turn them off in a minute. Yeah. At the end, that's called a benediction. All right, how many Sundays are there during the season, during the season of Advent? Five. 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 Not twelve. Well, let me give you a clue. Last week was the first Sunday of Advent, and Christmas is how many days away? Twenty-five. Leslie's back there giving you the high sign. Four. 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 This year, Christmas Eve is on Saturday. Uh -huh. What's in between Advent and Epiphany? Christmas. Uh -huh. So that whole time is Christmas. Yeah, Advent is up to Christmas. Christmas Eve is when Christmas starts. And it goes all the way to Epiphany. Christmas time. Which is January 6th. Okay. Which is 12 days. There's a song about it. The 12 days of Christmas. Okay. Cool. All right, we got four. What's the four for? Four days. Oh, yeah, that's right. What member of the Holy Trinity is often represented by a dove or a flame? Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Yeah, I heard it. Somebody died. Let it go. Easter, Easter, my target is bad. Always falls in one, you know, and I look at them and I don't see it. Uh, Easter always falls in one of these two months. What two months are they? March, March, March or April. March or April. It is the, what is it? the first Sunday after the first Holy Day after March. That's right. And the earliest it can be is March the 23rd. Right. And we've had it that early pretty recently, a couple of years ago. March and April. And is that all? No. Ah, here we go. Okay, so you're running a race. Right before the finish line, you pass the person who's in third place. And what place do you finish? Third. 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 Oh, <laughs> Uh, you know, see, we, we really believe that it takes mental power to understand the Bible, so we have some mental questions as well as scriptural ones. All right, next question. David's son, Absalom, murdered his half-brother who raped his sister, Tamar. What was Absalom's half-brother's name? Y'all were doing so well. I don't have any. No guesses. Start with an A. The answer is Amnon. Oh. oh well. You know, you have to give me one you don't know. Okay. Galatia, Ephesus, and Colossae, cities to whom Paul wrote letters, are located in what current day country? Iran? Right. No. Turkey. Who said that? Israel. JT, Turkey. Turkey. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, JT's a preacher. He's supposed to. Be. <laughs> Members of the Religious Society of Friends Church are better known by what name? Quaker. Quaker, that's right. And in our community, where's the biggest Quaker community? Anybody know? Friendswood. People that go to Quaker churches are called Friends. Guess what Friendswood is named after? Coptic Christians live mostly in what country? <laughs> Who said that? Did you, uh, did you say that? Back there? Yeah. Leslie said it. She just described. What Wesleyan scholar came up with the term 
the Wesleyan quadrilateral. <laughs> Everybody's looking at JT. Uh, what Asbury was it? No. Oh, not coach. No. <laughs> I just get the line. You'll get there eventually. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I know it wasn't John Wesley, though. No, 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 no. It was a it was a professor at Perkins School of Theology. His name is oh. Albert Cotter. Oh, yeah. And he wished he would have never said it in the way of a tra of, a, of a, the whole deal of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. And it, depending on the circumstance, one is primary over the other. But he wished he wouldn't have put it in the everybody wants to make this square into a trapezoid anyway. It's just it takes all four of those to study the Bible and to be closer to Christ. I think that's the last one. All right, we're gonna watch the video and then we're gonna worship. Tonight we're singing um, some hymns. They're they're gonna think we're gonna the first one is Amazing Grace Change, the one we do here all the time on Saturday night. Leslie's gonna be playing on the piano. And uh, and then uh, after that we're gonna sing another little short one. We're gonna it's kind of a prayerful thing. And then we're gonna pray and light the advent candle. And uh, and so the movie's ready. Go. In our church we love God. Make no mistake about that. In our church we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. In our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts, and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for His. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's Word. It is real, it is living, it is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. We believe that God gives His love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but He is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that He really died on the cross, and that He really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message. Chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. Welcome to our church. I forgot to mention to you if you're interested in memorializing or honoring somebody with the poinsettia, the, the, poinsettia, the uh, envelopes are in the back. Uh, as you're able and willing, would you stand as we sing these? This is a great hymn of the church. Oh. 
wonder sometimes if, if we look around at church and the disinterest that there seems to be in church, and, and we wonder why that is, I, I would encourage you to talk to people about why they don't go. Now, what I can tell you is they think we think we're better than them. We think we're righteous. Anybody in here think they're righteous today? I don't think so. But they don't know that. They don't know that. And, and so it takes a lot of work. You know, there's a, a one of the waitresses down at Papa Yoke, you know, she's she when she saw my credit card, she said, Oh, I've heard about you. I'm sure from Jessica. But uh, you know, I don't know what that means except that, you know, I said, Well, you ought to come. She said, I'm coming, but she hadn't been here yet. But we don't quit asking, do we? Years ago when we were at LaPorte, and we were the outsiders when we went there. Uh, first of all, we lived in Deer Park. That was evil. And, uh, and we were the outsiders. And so we were there. And, and uh, the pastor, Marlon Finn, asked me to start a Sunday school class, which I did. And Kathy, she didn't want to teach the class, but she's a pretty good person to talk to people. And so new people would come into the church. And she'd say, why don't you come visit our class? Well, this one guy, his name was Bill Love. I might have told you this story before. But Bill Love was, uh, had been kicked out as a Sunday school teacher by the church, by the pastor, some years before because he smoked. They said, we can't allow any of our Sunday school teachers to smoke. I don't know if you can believe that was happening then, but it did. And so he wasn't going back. And this guy was probably 70 years old or maybe more. And, uh, and, and so we would run into him at rotary meetings, you know. And, and in fact, that one night, I think he had a couple of drinks before Kathy really got on him. But, but the whole endeavor she made with him is, you just come once. Just come once. Oh, I've already done Sunday school. I'm not going to do that. I don't need to do that. I'm, I'm going to go to church. Well, after I don't know how many weeks of working on Bill, Bill came to Sunday school. And Bill didn't miss another day of Sunday school until he died. Because he didn't know that it was okay to get in a class where people didn't have to agree. People out there somewhere think that if you come here, you have to agree with everything I think. Trust me, that is not true. And you don't want to. Because I think some very strange things. <laughs> I don't want to be a dictator. What I want to do is be a person that's on a journey with you to do some of the things that this passage talks about so that we can rejoice in the Lord and we can do it with people that aren't like us. And that's the hardest thing, isn't it? I don't know how uncomfortable, well I do know, if you, I went to a funeral for a co-worker one time. It was an African-American church. I was the only Anglo in the room. I felt uncomfortable. They were nice. They were friendly. But I felt uncomfortable. 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is still the most segregated time in America for church. There's no reason for it to be that way. Now what you hear people in the majority, whether it's a black church or a white church, what you'll hear them say is they don't worship like we do. Well, let me tell you, if you went to an AME or a CME church today, maybe tomorrow, you would find pretty much the same order of worship that we use on Sunday. You would pretty much have the same hymns. You would probably say the Apostles' Creed. And if you got their book of discipline out, you would think it was the same as ours. Now, they might have some praise dancing that we don't have. They might have some different things they do. But I want to tell you, if they're not going anywhere, they don't have a worship reference. And, and if we're going to do what Jesus called us to do, we've got to start reaching out to share others this amazing grace that we sang about a few minutes ago. We've got to share with others that we, too, have been saved. The very first Methodists met to flee the wrath to come. That's what they did. They got together to flee the wrath to come because they believed God was wrathful. And for years, people thought that was evangelism. Let's go out and tell people, if you don't get to church, you're going to hell. And that's just absurd. But what people don't know is about the community where somebody checks on you when you're in the hospital or somebody knows if you're missing or somebody cares how you're doing. They don't know what it's like to get, when you're feeling really grumpy, you know, we have, a, most of us have the ability to put on a, a faith self. You know, we can, we can, Fix everything up. Somebody say, how you doing? Say, I'm fine. Well, fine it stands for a lot of other things than fine. Trust me. I got a little thing on my wall in there. It says, when I tell you I'm okay, I'm really saying I'm frustrated. I'm, I'm disturbed. I'm depressed. I'm upset. 
You see, there's always this shell behind it, what's really going on. How many friends do you have that when you say, I'm fine, will look you in the eye and say, really? I care how you are. I care if things are going okay. I can't fix any of them, probably. But I care. So I think for me, when I read through these, these words here, I look at Gentiles as the outsiders, the people on the other side of the line. And i got to tell you, if you draw lines in your life, there's always going to be somebody on the other side. What we're supposed to be is inclusive. Jesus went and said, go make disciples. He said, didn't say, go make disciples that look like you. i, I got news for you. There probably aren't going to be any Methodists in heaven. Or Baptists. Or Church of Christ. That wouldn't be really upsetting to them. <laughs> what there are going to be in heaven is people that follow Christ. And if nothing else, the story we have in the past about the crook on the cross, when he looks over at Jesus and he says, you're the Messiah, he then gets murdered on the cross, and Jesus says, you'll be with me today in paradise. That guy didn't go in front of a church, he didn't profess his faith, he didn't do anything, except he knew who Jesus really was. And we need to do, we need to spend more time believing that. And if you don't believe it, that's work we got to do. And I know there are times in life when things are just going so bad you don't believe it. You, just, that, you know, God, if you were going to do something, I, look, I'm a realist. If God really listened to me, the Cowboys would be undefeated. <laughs> and they're not. And if God really listened to me and did everything I wanted God to do, somebody else would be really unhappy with me. I always think that's funny. I got asked to pray at the rodeo one year. They said, I want you to pray before the rodeo starts. I said, what do I pray for? Well, pray for the cowboys. I said, well, I don't want the animals to get hurt. He said, well, okay, pray for the animals too. They didn't invite me back. <laughs> uh, I mean, the reality is, you know, if we're going to live in this world, we got to realize Jesus is coming, right? And, and, and we're going to have that on December 24th. We're going to celebrate Jesus is coming. He's born again. He's coming to the world. And Emmanuel means God is with us. And us is inclusive. Those homeless people that are riding by here on their bikes and checking out the food box every day, God's with them too. Those people that are out there right now doing dastardly stuff, I believe God's with them. And I believe by our prayers, God can turn their hearts. But I think God needs to hear us care. Somebody asked me the other day when Jesus was coming back, you know, that's a good question. If I knew, as the scripture said last week, then you'd stay awake and wait. But I don't know. And you don't know. But I know when the time comes that he comes back, I, I, I would like for there to be a large number, if not everybody on the planet, that willfully got on their knees and professed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now that's my dream and that's my hope. And I think it's possible but we got work to do. JT's got work to do up in Perryville. We got work to do wherever we go. Today we're in a room full of, I don't know, 900 and some odd preachers and lay people. And we have work to do. Everybody in that room doesn't understand the power that Jesus Christ has to change them and to change life. This one preacher that I talked to, he said, uh, this whole discernment thing has made me wonder where I am. He said, I lean on the conservative side. But I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn what it is Jesus wants me to do. It's real easy to pick and choose. I gotta tell you, the things you're most scared about talking to somebody else out sometimes reflect what's going on in you. Sometimes when we're afraid that they might say no, it's because we think we say no. I'm always surprised when when I share with people, I've, I've told you so many stories about playing golf when I'm playing with the pickup guy that we have. And after about nine holes, they find out I'm a preacher, and then they start apologizing for their language. <laughs> you know, I, I told us, well, I wasn't always a preacher. I've said some of those words before. When I was working on the exercise here at this church 12 years ago, uh, the, the older fellow that was helping me, he said, preacher, i got to ask you, do you ever cuss? I said, on occasion, but I'm not there yet today. <laughs> Tony Campolo was preaching to a bunch of kids and he said a few words on purpose. 
And suddenly there was a buzz all around the room. He said, you people are more concerned with a bad word I just said than the message of Jesus Christ. I think this is real serious stuff. I believe Jesus really lived. I believe he walked around on the planet and I believe he crossed fences and borders and all kind of stuff with all kind of people. And I think when he looked out at those 5,000 people that day, he told the disciples, feed them all. He didn't say feed the ones that came prepared. He didn't feed the ones that do this. Feed all of them. And I think when I read these passages, I, 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 especially as we get into Advent, I start to think of the ways in which I need Jesus to come this year. I need transformation. I want to be more like Jesus than I am. And I don't believe I'm going to get there by just hanging out well with people that think like I do. In fact, sometimes it's good to hang out with people that think exactly the opposite as you. I've got some friends that are uh, uh, not very religious. I like to hang out with them. Hopefully they see something in me that they find attractive. I don't do it enough that I become like them. You with me? Amen. But I go in and I, I'm willing to share with them and present a positive image. One person told me the other day, said, I'm so glad that I have a chance to talk to you on, on occasion. Because every time I talk to you, I finish the conversation smiling. I find that my life is better with you in it. Oh, that wasn't Kathy either. She says that too. Her life is better than that. But I have these friends that, that I, some of them, I used to, Kathy Smith, a bunch of guys I used to work with in the police department. These guys, some of them don't do church. And it's easy when you're in that kind of job not to do church, right? You're working 24 different shifts. We have a lot of friends, don't we, that work in refineries and around here in different places. It's easy to get in the habit of not doing church. It's easy to think church wouldn't make any difference in my life. But let me tell you, I, I spent a good hour or so with a young man on Monday. And he's lonely. He knows he's lonely. His loneliness leads to destructive behavior. He has a very, very, very small circle of people he talks to. If you've known me any time at all, you know I think the biggest solution to almost every problem is community. When we're in community with people, then we're in a group. We can do stuff together we can never do by ourselves. I think community is powerful. You want to know how AA works? It works because of community. You want to know how Weight Watchers works? It works because of community. You want to know how church transforms lives? It's because of community. And being present is one of the things we promise when we join. We're going to be there with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. And presence means something. It doesn't just mean something to the preacher. I'm not sitting there saying, oh my gosh, there's only so many people here today. That doesn't matter to me very much. But what does matter is when that person that, that you haven't seen for a while is coming back and you get to have that smile or that hug or that handshake. Thank goodness we're past the social distancing thing. And so I think we have a real opportunity to live out some of what he's talking about in this passage, what the author of Romans is saying. Can you imagine answering a prayer or having a prayer that says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I had the pleasure of doing a wedding a week ago Friday. I've done a few. And I told the couple, and I, I probably said it in Jessica's wedding, and I probably said it in y'all's wedding, that you know, the, the love chapter in chapter 13 uh, of 1 Corinthians talks about love, and it talks about life. You know, it has that famous statement, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child. When I became an adult, I put away childish ways. That's not really the meat of that old passage. What is the meat of that passage is when it says praying's going to end. Prophesying or talking, that's going to end. But what never ends is love. Love is eternal. It's forever. Your parents gone on to be with God, that love's still there. Whatever it is, love transcends death. It transcends everything else. It is the one thing 
they can unite us in this country, in this world, and it's more important than anything else. And according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 13, it's the only thing that never dies. Hope is important. Love is important. All of them are important. But the most important of these is love. So tonight as we come to the table, I, you know, I, I, my goal this year for Advent is for us to think about why we need Jesus to come. I mean, for years and years, I just said, well, it's expected. We need to be like that expected mother, you know. We're, we're ready for the baby. And I know every expected mother is ready for the baby in about nine months. Sometimes it's seven. They're ready for the baby. And we're ready for that. But it's not so much as that. What happens when that baby comes? Life is forever changed. Forever changed. So when this baby comes, when this baby is born, when we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ on December the 25th, what's going to change for you? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Gracious God, you, you've made such an amazing creation. People come in all shapes, sizes, colors. They're all different. But they're all yours. And God, we confess that sometimes we have failed to live out the life you called us to live. We've not always been obedient. In fact, sometimes we've been disobedient. But we believe with your grace, with your love, we can do better. So tonight as we come to your holy table, make this bread become for us the body of Christ, this cup, the blood of Christ, make these things become for us real. So that as we stick out our hand and we put this piece of bread dipped in grape juice in our hand, we are accepting once again Jesus Christ. And over the next two weeks until we get to Christmas, we can start to understand what a difference it's going to make for Christmas to come this year. Amen. When Jesus was in the upper room, he broke the bread. He said, this is my body, it's broken for you. Is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? After supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks over the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this, all of you. And do it as often as you will. And remember me. Remember what we sang while we Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Let me invite Leslie to come first so we can play for us while we come. The offering plate here at Hope is in the back on Saturday nights, and the bucket up here starting last week uh, is good. Any, any spare change, Nichols down to quarter corner, we're going to send to the Methodist Children's Home to support children there. So the table's prepared. Uh, the altar rails still work. You just be looking right at the point says. If you choose to pray, you're welcome to do that. Come to the table. Come to this place for heaven and earth to meet. Come to you.
So we've been to the place where heaven and earth meet, but we've only begun to see what God is calling us to do. All of the Bible stories leave a remnant of people. Whatever Old Testament story you want to read, they leave a remnant of people that God chooses to send forth to spread the word. And I believe He's choosing us to make a difference in the kingdom, the one we live in right now. And so I'm hoping but as the weeks go by, we start to realize why we need Jesus so much and why he's coming again into our lives. Friends, it's a joy to be with you tonight. Uh, this is that benediction we were talking about earlier. Uh, as you go from this place, go in peace. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, I do believe the Cowboys are playing tomorrow night. It would be good if you cheered for them. And so uh, other than that, go in peace. Amen.